his armies. And this is the New English translation. This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies has said. These people have said, the time for rebuilding the Lord's temple has not yet come. The Lord's message came through the prophet Haggai as follows. Is it right for you to live in richly paneled houses while my temple is in ruins? Hear then. This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies has said. Think carefully about what you are doing. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but are never filled. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but are not warm. Those who earn wages end up with holes in their money bags. Moreover, this is what the Lord of Heaven's armies has said. Pay, cut, pay close attention to these things also. Go up to the hill country and bring back timber to build the temple. Then I will be pleased and honored, says the Lord. You expected a large harvest, but instead there was little. And when you would bring it home, I would blow it right away. Why, asked the Lord of Heaven's armies? Because my temple remains in ruins, thanks to each of you favoring his own house. This is why the sky has held back its dew, and the earth its produce. Moreover, I have called for a drought that will affect the fields, the hill country, the grain, new wine, fresh olive oil, and everything that grows from the ground. It also will harm people and animals and everything they produce. Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheaton, and the high priest Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, along with the whole remnant of the people, obeyed the Lord their God. They responded favorably to the message of the prophet Haggai, who spoke just as the Lord their God had instructed him, and the people began to respect the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's announcement to the people. I am with you, decries the Lord. So the Lord energized and encouraged Zerubbabel, son of Shealto, governor of Judah, the high priest Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, and the whole remnant of the people. They came and worked in the temple of their God, the Lord of Heaven's armies. This took place on the 24th day of the sixth month of King Darius, second year. When Haggai wrote this, the temple had been started. But it wasn't finished. We can read the back history of all this in Ezra 1 and 6, 1 through 6 and 2 Kings 24 and 5. In Ezra 1 and 6, 1 through 6 is the history of how King Cyrus was motivated by God to send the Israelites back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And he also said all the items that were in the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had taken. In both Ezra and King, 2 Kings we find the events that led up to this point of why it was that God had Haggai Go to the people and talk to them about why it was that they did not finish the temple. In 2 Kings is where you find that the people were taken to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. And he is the one who destroyed the temple. In 2 Kings 24 verse 20, what follows is a record of what happened to Jerusalem and Judea because of the Lord's anger. He finally threw them out of his presence. This was the beginning of their exile in Babylon. Immediately I have one question. What led to God's anger? In 2 Kings 21, it says, 
that God said he is going to take Jerusalem and wipe them out. Like what, how the one cleans a plate. How it says he wipes a plate on both sides. Can you imagine being the focus of God's wrath, his anger? He's going to wipe you out. Those of you who do dishes know how clean you want your dishes to be. And he's going to wipe Jerusalem out? So what led to God's anger? His disobedience. Why was God angry with his people? What did they do that was so horrendous he's going to wipe them out? He's going to wipe out the city. Well, if you read chapter 21 of 2 Kings, the anger came because Manasseh did evil in the sight of the Lord and committed the same horrible sins practiced by the nations whom the Lord drove out from before the Israelites. When the Israelites came into Canaan, he drove out the people before them. Now here Manasseh was taking on the same traditions, doing the same things. Manasseh, Manasseh actually passed his own son through the fire. He sacrificed his own child in worshiping other people, other gods. And Ezra is told about the rebuilding of the temple. How the older generation who had seen Solomon's temple were disappointed in how the new one was looking. It wasn't as great and magnificent. It was just a plain old ho-hum building. And they were disappointed in this. So at this point it discouraged them. Also the locals, the society around them, was working against them. It tells us they actually organized to be against them. And the combination of these things discouraged them from rebuilding the temple, and so they stopped. It was easier to follow the crowd. It was the path of least resistance. It's not God's will, is what they said. How often have you heard that? I work hard at doing the will of God, and then things start to go wrong. It gets hard to keep going down the path that I'm on. It must not be God's will for this to happen. If it's God's time, it will happen. It's all about God's time and not my time. God said doesn't see time the same as I do. To God, a thousand years is a day and a day is a thousand years. So in God's time, it's not my time, it's God's time. So it must not be His will. It just got too hard. It was a sign that God didn't want me to do it. How often have you used these phrases? How often have you heard it said? Being that there was organized opposition to the rebuilding of the temple, the people just used that excuse or just figured that God didn't want it built at this time. Would God give them a mixed message? He actually brought them back to Jerusalem and told them to rebuild the temple, rebuild Jerusalem. Would God give them a mixed message? 
that halfway through they're supposed to stop. He also put it into King Cyrus to send all the articles back. It's a pretty good sign that God was with them, and it was His will. When reading Ezra, it would seem that they had actually built the temple at least halfway. But they never finished it. And it's been a number of years since anything was done to the temple. But they had time to take upon themselves to build their own houses. It, talks, it says about paneled houses. It's a way of saying, I believe, they were pretty nice houses. It appears there is no opposition from the society and the people around them to stop them from building these houses. So this is pretty good. That must have been God's will for us to build our houses first. But wouldn't God want them to finish the temple, the Lord's house, so they could worship Him in an organized way? The easier path was to just not resist the locals and do as they wanted. But did that really satisfy God's will? Is it the right thing to do to make sure you don't upset the locals? Is it the right thing to do as we as Christians to tiptoe around others so we don't stomp on somebody's toes? That we don't offend somebody because of our beliefs? As I look around at society, I wonder, do I as a Christian have the backbone to stand for Jesus and declare I will live for Jesus Christ and not worry about how it affects the non-believer. Is that the right attitude? Am I as a believer willing to stand on the path to stay on the path that God has said, that laid out for me, no matter how it affects others around me? Or will I bend the word of God so that I don't offend somebody? If I offend someone, then I get accused of not loving as Jesus loved. We all hear that. We need to love as Jesus loved. With open arms for anything and any for everything. That way we don't offend somebody. If we offend a sinner, then they won't come to Jesus Christ. To love others. I need to be tolerant of their way of life. To the way of reading the Bible. To their interpretation of Scripture. <coughs> Even though they leave some parts unread, I must be expect, accepting of them. Be tolerant of their beliefs. So that I can love them as Jesus loved. Jesus stepped on toes. Quite feeble. You mean you didn't believe anything I just said? Some of it. Some of it's not good. <laughs> How's your toes feeling? Do you want your hurt feelings hurt you? <laughs> I've been there. I've been. I offended somebody. They won't speak to me now. But I told what was in the Bible.
My question is this. How does Jesus love me? He does not bless those who do not believe in Him and live for Him. How can I love others as Jesus loves if I don't stand on the truth of Jesus Christ? Did Jesus bend the truth so He wouldn't offend anybody? Jesus didn't bend the truth of God's Word when He talked to the Pharisees. He actually called them snakes. I don't recommend that you go out and tell a sinner he's a snake. No. Don't call them names. But did Jesus tell them half-truths so as not to offend the Pharisees and the scribes? No. How does my life affect those around me? I profess to be a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. I profess to believe in the Bible being the Word of God. I profess it is to be believed and followed. Every word in it. I'm a, to live according to the word and then I bend the word or eliminate some of it so that I don't offend someone. I bend the truth so as not to step on someone's toes. How is that a witness to the truth of God's Word? Then people say the reason they don't go to this or that church is because they're full of hypocrites. Why wouldn't they think I was a hypocrite? If I, am, if I say one thing and do another. I claim to love Jesus Christ. I claim to believe in His Word. I, believe, I claim to, that it is the truth. And we must stand on it. And then I bend it. Why would I be called a hypocrite? I must live my life in such a way that people will see the truth of God's Word through my life. We witness through our actions. We all are familiar with this saying, actions speak louder than words. The sinner is watching every Christian. He's not necessarily listening to what they say. They're watching what they do. A picture paints a thousand words. My question is, do you want to be a hypocrite or not? I like being loved. I like when people pat me on the back. I like when people come to me and talk to me. It makes me feel good. I love people. I love being around people. But that doesn't give me the license to accept their ways. To be tolerant of sin. The Lord of hosts, or heaven's armies, depending on which version you have, says these people have said the time for rebuilding the Lord's temple has not yet come.
these people. The King James, I think, says this people. As I studied that, I wondered, what is catching my eye on this? What has made me stop on that sentence? It's almost as if, not completely, that God is saying in disgust, these people, they don't care about me. Oh, they claim to be part of me. But when it comes right down to it, it's all about the others really like me, or how easy can life be. If the locals like me, then they will leave me alone. Life is good. If, if the society likes me, then I must be, be all right. When things get rough, you get pushed back. You get pushed back. It doesn't turn out the way you want it. It must not be God's will. I think we'll just give it up and chuck it off. We try to do things. We pray to God about it. We think this is what God wants from us. And life gets hard. It must not be God's will. Because I'm not finding it very easy. What would have happened if Jesus had said, Time has not yet to come, hasn't yet come? It must not be God's will. For me to finish what I've started? What would have happened? When Jesus was tortured and beaten, this is too rough. I can't take it anymore. When Satan came into the wilderness and tempted him, I can't take this anymore. The locals don't like me much. How long was it? How often did the Pharisees try to find a way to kill him? When Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane praying to the God the Father, sweating like blood. Man, this is hard. It must not be God's will. He must not want me to finish what I've started. Father, this isn't very loving of you. What would have happened? What happens when I say I can't take it no more? I can't do this anymore. When Satan puts things in our path and it gets hard. How many souls will be lost because I have decided it's too hard to go on? Now I've decided it must not be God's will. How many souls will be lost? Think carefully what you're doing. Consider your ways. You have planted much but have harvested, harvested little. You eat but are never filled. You drink but are still thirsty. You put on clothes but are not warm. Those who earn wages put their wages into money bags with holes. Then the Lord says, you expected a large harvest, but instead it was little. And when you would bring it home, I would blow it away. 
Why would I do this? Says the Lord. Asks the Lord. Why? Why does God do these things to us? The Lord uses hardships in different ways. Uses them to teach us patience so our faith can grow stronger. He tests our faith by putting things in our lives to see if we will keep looking to Him for support. God will allow or put hardships into our lives to discipline us when we are not living in His will. In Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 7, Have you forgotten the exhortation addressed to you as sons? My sons, do not scorn the Lord's discipline or give up when He corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and chastises every son he accepts. Endure your suffering as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? These people didn't rebuild the temple because of Satan working against them. They decided it wasn't worth it. But they did rebuild their homes to a high standard. God withheld His blessings. No crops, no money, no clothes, not enough water. Life was not satisfying. If it wasn't bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. How often have we heard that? What has luck got to do with it? Verse 6 says, You plant and harvest little, you eat but never fill, drink but always thirsty, put on clothes but always cold. Reading the Bible and the words do not seem to make much sense. Why? I've heard that over and over again. I read the Bible daily. But I can't make heads or tails out of it. It doesn't make sense. What am I missing? What am I doing wrong? Eat but never feed. Drink but always thirsty. Put on clothes, but always cold. When you read the Bible and don't allow it to come to your heart, you can drink from it, you can eat from it, but it's not going to fulfill you. You read the words on the Bible on those pages and wonder where God is. Why doesn't the Holy Spirit speak to me? Do you feel as if Jesus isn't walking with you? That He isn't close by? Have you ever disciplined a child for no reason? For no reason at all, just discipline. I'm guessing each time a parent disciplined a child, there was a reason. God doesn't discipline just because He can, there's a reason for it, He has a purpose. The Lord God loves you. And when you have Jesus Christ living in your heart, you are His child. When there is disobedience, there will be discipline. 
because of that love. Are you living for self? Roland touched on this a little bit about being selfish. Who are you living for? You living for yourself or are you living for God? Are you living with, for society so they don't bother you? They don't make things hard for you. Consider your ways. Whatever your life is not in obedience to God. That's the question you have to ask yourselves. Are you putting more time into fulfilling your desires? Because it isn't as hard to face instead of building up the temple of God. Which are you seeking first? The kingdom of God? Or the kingdom of self? Matthew 6, six Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. The New English translation reads, Above all, pursue his kingdom. Chase, run. I don't know how many are familiar with rabbit hunting and bigs. But if you have a rabbit dog, that hound will chase that rabbit. And 99% of the time, it is so focused on that rabbit, to get that rabbit, that it gets itself in trouble. Are you that focused on seeking the kingdom of Jesus Christ that no else, nothing else matters? Do you have tunnel vision for Jesus? It doesn't matter what society thinks or says. It doesn't matter whose toes you step on or who you offend. Are you focused? Are you running? Are you chasing after Jesus Christ? Chase, run after the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And see where it will lead you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. We come before you. Thanking you. For your precious word. Asking. Seeking. For your grace when things get hard. We ask for the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us in the paths of righteousness. Give us the courage and the stamina to run after and chase the righteousness of God. Give us, Heavenly Father, our daily bread, and lead us not into temptation. It is through Jesus Christ that we will be delivered from all evil. Pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.